All right. That should be the start of the stream. Let me just look over here and see if it's actually coming up. I see a little progress bar. Yeah, I see a little progress bar. As soon as it turns into the real show, then we'll go ahead and... Yeah, there we go. So, hey everybody, this is David, and we also have Geo and Potato Fox here as moderators helping out. And I'm trying out a new thing for the weekly chat because I was thinking what would make it more fun. And it might make it more fun if I could even like doodle a little bit and sketch in front of you while we're doing stuff. Part of the reason is because I'm trying to think through the new year of like, well, how can I maximize cool stuff that I'm doing for people? And one thing that I've been wanting to do like practically, like I think literally for five or six years is I've been wanting to make a perspective tutorial and I just never find the time because I've got too many projects I'm trying to do. So I was almost thinking, what if I could just talk through, do some tutorial stuff like every week when I'm answering questions and maybe that's a way I could generate a little more content and a little more fun stuff for you guys. And uh, yeah, and it also might keep the experience a little more focused, a little less chaotic. So we'll give it a shot this week and see how it goes. Uh, Geo, Tato, how are you guys doing? Doing well. I am conscious. <laughs> good. Conscious is good. That is better than the alternative. I do not agree. <laughs> well, if you need to get some sleep, Tato, I think I can handle it here. No, I'm fine for the time being. Alright, well... Probably. Well, we have a list of questions from, uh different users uh, that we can start throwing your way, Dave, whenever you want. Yeah, let's jump right in. Uh, Question time. Alright, both Tato and I collected different questions, so I think maybe the most fair thing is we uh, draw back and forth while you work on whatever you want to work on. Cool. I'm going to draw a little bit of Wisp because I heard someone requested that. These might be kind of like quick, sketchy drawings because, you know, the weekly chat is supposed to be kind of a quick, informal thing, but yeah, it's better than nothing. So hit me with some questions. Alright. So the first question is... Is there a noticeable? Oh, there is a noticeable break in the Sky Road that's located next to the Eclipse District. Uh, is this a large lake that is acted as an obstacle and forced the builders to go around it to continue constructing the wall, or was there a piece of section that sunk beneath the water due to sinkhole? All right. Um. Oh, I, I remember what it looks like. I would say it's a lake, because I know the Calypso District, we have a lot of lakes in there. It's part of the runoff from the Starfall Mountains, and that's supposed to be one of the features, is there's a lot of lakes, a lot of canals, um, a little bit reminiscent of, like, you know, some of, like, the Italian stuff with the canals there. So, yep, there's a chunk where the wall, like, they just decided, I guess we don't need the wall right here, because the lake was fairly difficult to traverse for people at that time. So, there's just a chunk where they built the wall into, out into the lake a ways, and they decided, uh, that's good enough. And so they just skipped a chunk of the wall. Awesome. Tato, did you want to read a question? Yes, sure. Yeah, let's have a look. Do you believe there is any meaning in life beside death and taxes? <laughs> um, yes, cartoons. Cartoons and maybe Bitcoin. <laughs> Well, that answers that. Next. <laughs> okay. So, let's see. I lost my list. Here it is. How's the terrain environment like in areas that are outside the Calypso and Rustle districts? Uh, is it a lot of open farmland, marsh areas, woodland, or a mix in variety? I haven't really gone into the map and dictated like all of the terrain, so I would say it's mainly a mix. There's some farmland, there is like a little bit of wilderness, but most of the stuff inside the Sky Road, there's not like huge swaths of wilderness where you can really get lost. It's mostly going to be like agrarian, maybe maybe some rural stuff. And then of course the closer you get to Sabaton, the center point, uh, the more it's going to be like a lot more industrialized, a lot more urban. But beyond that, I haven't really gone in in high resolution and uh, determined which parts of the city precisely are what and, you know, what the relative size is and all that. Gotcha. On the same user, is the brain a, a computer, basically? Do you consider the brain a computer? Um, I don't know if the brain is a computer, but... If I got some more inputs, I might be able to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Man, 
man, you're just nailing these philosophical questions, Dave. That's what people come to me for, the deep philopopical questions. They love my responses. They love my, my brilliant insights. All right. So here's an interesting question. I actually like this one. Um, what's the Troika's policy regarding uh, handling the deaths of their operatives? Um, what do they do with the bodies or remains? Um, you know, are loved ones notified, or do they have any sort of dog tags or identification if they're lost in combat? That's what that's a really good question. I like that one. And the answer is, it's going to kind of change as the series goes without getting too terribly spoilery. But at this point in the graphic novels, uh, the Troika is intended to be really an underground organization. You know, it's like secret. They've got like cells set up all around. No one's really supposed to know about it. So they definitely do not have dog tags or any identifying information like that. Because that would be, you know, if they got picked up for some random thing and then, you know, the law enforcement officer saw a dog tag for some mystery organization, that wouldn't be the best scenario. And you know, sometimes Troika guys, they wear a bunch of different hats, some of them might be involved in Sinner's Mark and running for Mente, and maybe they do get picked up by law enforcement sometimes, and it's like, it's fine if they catch onto the one illegal thing that they know you're doing, because you know, there can be a bit of an understanding, but you don't want them to know about the illegal thing that they don't know that you're doing. So they've got no dog tags or anything like that, and typically if there's a death, the Troika don't have like a formal system for handling it because they're supposed to, again, they're supposed to be a secret organization. So they're not going to like go and pick up the body from the morgue and be like, hey, we need to have a military burial for this guy. Essentially, if there's anything that would tie the death back to them, they will try to sanitize the scene of the uh, whatever happened. If there was like a shootout or a crime, essentially, they just try to sanitize it to make sure that it doesn't leave evidence that they exist. And beyond that, they leave it and like things take their course whether law enforcement finds those bodies or the family deals with funeral arrangements or what have you but yeah since since they're not really legally permitted to exist and they're supposed to be top secret there's not any kind of formal funeral arrangements or anything i mean they might have some way of just remembering the people that they know that get killed but it's it's not going to be like an organization wide like okay let's put it on the calendar and we'll we'll you know we'll, we'll add it to the itinerary that sort of thing Thing. Indeed. Any other questions bouncing around in there? Oh, well, we got plenty more. It's Tato's turn. Got a couple of more philosophical ones. Oh which boy. Are possibly being uh, answered very thoroughly and completely. If you had to, if you could bring a philosopher back, who would it be and why? Um, Karl Marx, so he could understand the magnitude of his stupidity. Oh. <laughs> I mean, at the time, like, in his defense, he probably had no way of understanding just how bad his ideas were. But now that we have the benefit of um, lots and lots of experimentation throughout various countries and points in time, you know, like, we can see that the application it le left a little something to be desired in most cases. Well, there was also the point where he was a freeloader who lived in his friends' houses, so he probably didn't actually care. Yeah, I won't have anyone speaking ill of Bernie Sanders on this stream. <laughs> Next question. Look, man, you don't understand the struggle of being a writer, man. <laughs> but I'm an artist. I can't, like, you know, pay for your couch or anything. All right. So, uh, another question. Well, these are all DK questions. I don't, I don't have the cool philosophical questions. Um, how does Andaruna create its electricity? Is it uh, hydropower or something else? Do they just have... A warehouse full of uh, electric type uh, Rio Necos that get tickled? Actually, this is another good question, and it bumps into a point of lore that I kind of have vaguely outlined, but I haven't, again, I haven't gone into extreme detail. And the thing is, they have something that is very much like electricity, but it's not exactly electricity. Um, what I had in mind was that stuff in the Starfall Mountains with the blue glow, um, Lunaris is the mineral that we call it. And what I had in mind is that this mineral has a lot of latent energy. And based on what you do with it chemically, you can unleash that energy. I mean, that's why it glows. It's just charged with energy. So they use, a, you know, Lunaris combined with some other chemicals. That's what they have for explosives. But if you combine it in a different way chemically, um, it can release that energy on a much more safe like manner. And that's where, basically where they get their 
electricity from. And it's like electricity, but it's not ex exactly electricity. So it's kind of a fantasy analog, and it's to do with the mineral that is like just a natural resource in their in their region. It appears there are no more philosophical questions. Oh no. They must have had their fill. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, Dave, just die. <laughs> <laughs> what is the strangest experience you have had at a convention? The strangest experience I've had at a convention? Um, Liz, does anything spring to mind for you right away? I'm trying to... This guy keeps bringing us cookies. Oh yeah! It's... It's kind of strange, but I love it. This, there's this guy, and I feel so bad. I want to remember his name, but he always brings us these homemade cookies that are just astonishing. They're, like, loaded with, like, peanut butter and, like, real honey. Like, I mean, these cookies are so rich. If you put it on a paper plate, it basically burns through the plate within ten minutes. You can see through the plate. No, seriously, it's, that's true. They're, they're dense. They're rich. They are hypercharged cookies. Yeah, so these cookies, like, okay, they're very good, but the weird thing is, I can never remember the guy's name, he's given me so many cookies, but then when I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll cheat by remembering his name, I'll just look at his, uh, I'll look at his badge, and then he's got, like, 57 badges, and they all have a different name on it, and I'm like, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I've just resorted to calling him Mr. Cookie, and I guess that's my convention anecdote for today. And actually, uh, at uh, MFF, someone gave you some homemade mead, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, that mead was very good, and I enjoyed that. It was, I don't know, some of the people out there... Drink strange liquids, Dave. I shouldn't drink strange liquids? Well, I'll test it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Dave. He'll probably be all right. Yeah. All right, any more uh, other questions bouncing? Yeah, we, we got more, Dave. You don't get to escape, man. You don't get to just draw. You get to talk to us the whole time. All right. All right. So, uh, next question is, uh, does V have her own private room in the Troika headquarters, like the Prelude, or does she sleep uh, in uh, common quarters like everyone else? That's a pretty good question. I don't think it's, like, super spoilery, so I'll just say that um, they don't actually stay at the Troika headquarters very often. Because, again, being a secret organization, most of them actually have, like, normal places where they live, and a lot of them even have normal jobs. The Troika base that you see in Volume 3 and, like, the other volumes, uh, there's, well, there's a lot of other Troika bases, too, but essentially, Sinter and Igrath have been building out infrastructure, preparing for a big upgrade and a big military push, and currently, those structures are usually empty, and you only get, like, cells of Troika that'll pop into a structure for one week for training, they might pop into another structure for training, but yeah, generally speaking, they don't stay 24-7 at these structures, like, you know, 365 days a year, because at that point you'd be bringing a lot of supplies in, a lot of food in constantly, and it might start to look a little suspicious, even if they're being sneaky, so just to stay on the down low, most of the time they actually just, um, they live separate and they live in normal housing situations and then they just go to those structures when they're going to have a training session with their cell and that's another reason why they keep the structures pretty much empty because you don't want to have like 80 percent of your troika members living in a few locations because then they raid those those locations and boom your entire organization is compromised and they don't even all train at the same time that's why you have individual people that develop one cell and they'll come in and train at that structure and they'll go out and then you'll have another cell train on another time. So they schedule their training to make sure that again, if there's kind of if there's a shock trooper raid, uh, they're only going to get one cell's worth of people. They're not going to take down everybody. So it's a way to try to essentially make their organization more durable in case of worst case scenarios. Makes sense. Spiffing. I'm getting some perspective builds ready to show people like some of the stuff you can do with two-point perspective and simulating camera angles. And after, after we get through the reader questions, I'll talk a little bit about that. And hopefully when I talk about it, I can explain kind of what I'm thinking with it a bit more. But for now, let's get through those questions. There's not a lot more from me. This one sounds a bit stalkery-ish, but who do you hang out with aside from Bone? Uh, who do I hang out with aside from Bone? Specifically um, artists. Artists. Or who would you hang out with? 
oh, I would hang out with a lot of people, but it just comes down to, like, who's actually around. And, I don't know, we hang out with, uh, Colin comes around sometimes. He's a musician. He's really cool. He's nice. Um, let's see. I don't know. Yeah, so it's not a whole lot of people. I've kind of... People don't live near us. Yeah, most people don't live near us, so usually it's conventions when I see people. And, yeah, sometimes we have family come over. And there's probably some people right now that are irritated that I'm forgetting about them. Or maybe they don't want me to mention them. But, yeah, anyway, so we don't usually spend a lot of time hanging out. But we do have some local friends. Some of them aren't artists. Some of them are just, you know, they're just cool people that are fun to hang out with, play some games with, that sort of thing. Okay. Stone King. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I have yeah. three more questions on my list. Sure, let's go. Um, the next one is, how does Anduruna obtain flow with seeds? Um, according to lore, they wash up on the northern dunes, and then uh, Anduruna competes with the nor northern settlement for seeds. But who <laughs> collects for Anduruna? Is it the CCA? Are they licensed uh, collectors? And how does it operate? Actually, the real answer of who collects for Anduruna is those northern settlements. <laughs> and that's why there's a lot of black market dealings, because... Even though, you know, they've been banished and they're supposedly persona non grata, well, they happen to be in control of a major industry and Andruna kind of needs access to it, so there's a lot of under-the-table dealings, a lot of officials getting paid off. And there are, like, you know, some CCA places that are just like, oh yeah, it's our job to go out and harvest those seeds, all right, but the reality is they tend to wind up just sort of paying off some officials and just getting the seeds from, you know, the people that actually live in that region and, like, manage to get access to them. So the answer to that is there's a lot of corruption and black market dealing, and every, it's kind of an open secret. Like, everyone kind of knows that's the way it works. They just can't admit it out loud because it would indicate to the general population that they're not, like, the best at everything. Tato? Not really. No? Okay, I'll just keep going down my list then if I'm the last man standing here. Yeah, let's rock and roll. Alright. So, how is the, the depiction of Dreamkeeper powers and abilities done in popular media in Andruma, like uh, newscasts, video games, literature, etc.? Um, examples being superheroes or even outright depictions of powers usage. Is it allowed? Is it regulated? Or is it discouraged? Um, how is it treated in fiction? Actually, I think it might get a little spoilery, but I can talk about the basics of it. We're going to touch on that a little bit in Prelude with uh, Trio de Fortress, which is Gorse's favorite superhero team. There's Trio de Fortress, and I think the tagline for the Trio de Fortress show is like, Power for good! And it's yeah, it's very, very cheesy, very fun. But in this fictional cartoon show that takes place in the dream world, um, yeah, the characters use their powers for good, and it winds up being something where it, it's a little controversial because it's like, well, it's not illegal to show that, but maybe it should be because it, it's so bad to encourage that in children. So it, we might touch on that to some degree in Prelude. Awesome. All right, and then the last official question I have before we get to talk about what you care about Woo! <laughs> is how much does singing matter to Vant? Uh, it's implied that her mother is pushing her to train for those sorts of things, but we have yet to see any indication of whether it's something that Vant enjoys. Um, and if that's too plot vaulty, uh, answer the question of how good is Vant's singing voice and what's the odds of her talent demolishing tinsel in the Andrew and Munich music scene if she was ever given a chance. All right. Well, yeah. All right, Liz is telling me that Vanth is just a trainer. She's just training. So, yeah, I would say that generally Vanth's mom is very interested in having Vanth sing. And Vanth has a very, very good voice. But Vanth, uh, she just wants to be out there, like, doing things that are, like, you know, that matter in the real world. So Vanth, is, she's very ambitious. She kind of wants to get out there and, like, really... Like even in her room, you see some of the some of the toys and things she has are like fall guard, like uh, players and athletes and stuff. So she dreams of just like doing things. And to, in Vance's mind, singing is not doing things. Singing is just making noise. 
And even though she's very naturally gifted for that, and her mom is trying to encourage that, it, it's not really the direction Vanth wants to go, so that's a source of conflict for them. Would you describe Vanth's singing voice as lower in register, or higher, somewhere in between? I'd, ha- I'd probably have to consult with Liz about that, because we don't discuss like how the characters would sound in detail that much. Sometimes it comes up, but usually we're just making the comics, so we don't have to answer sometimes that sort of... Sometimes we have to like, listen to a voice, yeah. and then... Yeah, Liz is saying sometimes we have to actually hear a voice to be like, oh, that would actually be perfect for Blankety Blank. But I don't know, since we're not casting any animation currently, it, it's not something we really have to invest a lot of uh, thought into, I guess. All right, well, that's all I have for questions, so I suppose you're a free man from this point forward. Cool, cool. Well, in that case, let me see. I think I had a list of some brief Dreamkeeper-y announcements, so I'll just run through those really quick. Uh, da 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 Oh yeah, um, if anyone was back in the Firebrat campaign that we did last year, those books are being delivered right now, and if you haven't filled out your survey, go ahead and fill it out, and I will get your book in the mail. And Mike Rosen is signing the copies we sent to him as we speak. So yeah, delivering on Firebrat. Uh, We just renewed the license for Skirmish with the EPF developers, and so I should be getting an ETA from them on the strategy guide and the art book, and then once they get me the text, I can put together the pictures, and we will deliver on Wave 2 of Skirmish. Um, other good news I'm not sure if you guys have been following some of my articles I post but we did something recently about like uh, terrible nasty things in the fandom and we would we wished that conventions would maybe not let people that are legally convicted of you know raping children maybe they shouldn't be around children at conventions and there's good news on that front I'd, I'd essentially given up because we got so much pushback on these suggestions but the convention further confusion actually did precisely what we wanted. They integrated this into their convention policy, and so they said that anyone that has a history of sexual violence or pedophilia, um, they're not supposed to show up at the convention, so that's actually kind of what we wanted. In my petition, I did clarify that maybe we should constrain it to people that have been convicted, you know, in the court of law, because otherwise, otherwise it gets a little tricky on exactly how do you determine whether someone is guilty of what they're being accused of. But even so, it's better than nothing. I'm glad that somebody out there, some convention, I don't know if it was our influence or not, but either way, I'm, I'm glad that someone demonstrated that, yeah, you, you can do that. Your convention doesn't explode. It's just a common sense amendment to your policy. Um, what else have we got? I'm um, getting ready and geared up to do volume five. I've cleared out a bunch of commissions. And also, False Start by Bonitis is going to be probably kick, getting kickstarted, I think, this year. Uh, early this year probably so i'll consult with him when that's happening all right and we answered a bunch of questions and i drew wisp here what what liz um do you know when the projected volume five release would be do i know when the projected volume five release would be not yet but i know we're going to be sprinting on it pretty fast here now that i got my commission plate cleared off I definitely want it to be within a year if it's not if it's not like done this time next year it's going to be almost done because essentially, like, I know we've been doing a lot of projects. We had, like, the plush Kickstarter. We illustrated the novel. We illustrated the game. And those were, like, massive projects in and of themselves. But now that all that is kind of cleared out, I'm just going to be sprinting on Volume 5. And I'm going to try to keep my schedule very focused on that. All right. So I actually have a question uh, related to that. Personal yeah. Question. Um, how has your workflow or how you approach volumes evolved over the years from when you were first starting on like V1 and V2 to now, uh, you know, with V5 more than 10 years later? Um, I would say I, I tend to like to still go chronologically from the start of the book to the end. It just feels a little more right. And I'm a little more, um, I've got a little bit more of a pipeline now. Like originally I would like draw a page and color a page and then go to the next page and draw and color it. But now I really like to just uh, do the blue line sketch for like maybe three to five pages at once, do the pencils for those pages. And then after we get a whole scene done or a few scenes done, then I go through and shade it after it's been color blocked. So I guess it's gotten a little more organized in terms of like the assembly line nature of it. Cool. All right. And so... I'm just going to talk very briefly about perspective, and then it'll be right around a half hour, and I'll say that's pretty good for a weekly chat. So I've been wanting to do a perspective tutorial forever, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of brief points here. And the the thing I'm going to talk about is actually how perspective links up to the camera lens that you're using. 
Now, I know when you're drawing, technically you're not using a camera lens, but to get dif different kinds of cinematic effects in your work, you, you kind of want to be able to simulate a camera lens sometimes, because if you're watching a movie and you notice like the difference between like a zoomed-in lens or a wide-angle lens, it adds a totally different feel to the scene, and you really want to be able to capture those kinds of feels in your work if you want to. So the, so the question is, everyone kind of knows two-point perspective. It's like, oh, you got one point over here, woo, and you got the other point over there. And, you know, the one that connects them, that's the horizon line. And these basics are pretty well understood. But the question is, how exactly do you manipulate this to make it look as though we're looking through a zoom lens or a wide-angle lens or just a normal lens? And also, like, how do you make something look like it's closer to you versus farther away? Well, I'm not sure about the latter one, but I was just playing with it to see if I could figure out. I think if you put the vanishing points closer together, like this, then you can make the item look more like it's flying right into your eye. Because when those vanishing points start to come in closer together, it puts a lot more pressure on the angles of the item you're drawing. And also, if you think about it, if there's something really close to your eye, and you can see the lines going off in one direction versus the other, then you don't have to turn your head as far to really get the effect of it. So I think pushing the lines a little closer together can exaggerate the perspective and make it seem like something is like really tall or right up in your face. But to the main point, the camera angle point, the difference is this is almost like a normal scene. But let's say that you took a photograph with a camera, this is what you would get. But let's say you took a photograph with like a zoomed in camera, it would zoom in to a point that's smaller kind of like this. And then what you would do is you would take this and you would blow this up to the entire size of the screen. So the question is, what makes something like this that would be like blown up to the whole size of the screen different from this? And the answer is, when you have something like this as your like panel or your piece of paper, you notice the vanishing points are way off to the sides of it. Like the vanishing point isn't even on the piece of paper anymore, it's way out here. And I think I have one that looks like that, like this. Like you can see the vanishing points, they're not even on the piece of paper. So the more you zoom in like that, the more the, uh, the lines really start to be almost going at the same angle. Like here we have stuff coming from here. Here we have stuff coming from here. And the closer you zoom in, oops, wrong color. Yeah, the closer you zoom in, the more of those are almost going at the same angle like this. So if you look at a photograph where it's really, really zoomed in, you'll see that sometimes the lines are so, the, the vanishing point is so far off the edge of the screen, it almost looks like the lines going there are parallel. Like it almost looks like these are like completely parallel. You almost can't see the convergence. And this is the same thing for the blue lines going over here. So when you get that effect, when the lines are going almost parallel to one another off the side of the page, that's when you get an effect where it looks like it's more zoomed in. And that is how you simulate a zoom lens. It sounds probably more complicated, but if you try it out a few times, it's really cool. And see then if you took the same scene, it's a lot more obvious when you zoom out a little bit more that, oh, well of course these lines go at different angles, they're not necessarily parallel. And you zoom out all the way, Let's get rid of that. Yeah, you zoom out even further and you can see, well hey, I can even see the vanishing points. Of course they're not parallel to each other. So it's basically if you take this and just zoom way in, it's the same thing as simulating a zoom lens shot. And so when you're drawing it on a piece of paper, just uh, if you want it to be a zoomed in shot, push those vanishing points real far out to the sides. Sometimes you gotta stick a little piece of tape on the drawing board so you can actually draw the vanishing point way out there on the drawing board. Sometimes you have to do some other tricks to simulate long vanishing points. In fact, why don't I just go through one of those tricks really quick now. Let's say I've got a zoom in camera lens, and so I need a vanishing point that's way out there. We'll call this way out there. Now, I can't exactly walk across the entire room every time I need to draw a line if I have a vanishing point that's super far out there. So what you do is if you have a vanishing point that's just ridiculously across the room, you need your camera to be really zoomed in for this shot, uh, you basically grab a ruler, or here we can even just use a little blump, and I'm just going to make these blobs over here. 
And there's a secret reason I'm making blobs that you'll find out pretty soon. And obviously, if you're working with pencil and paper, which I usually am, um, you just like make some notches. You get like a piece of paper, you put a notch on it, and then you just take the paper down so you can see where all the notches go. So there we go. We got some uh, some little blobby things on this side of the paper. And then you go over here, and you do a blobby thing that's a little bit smaller. Oops, that was the same layer. Didn't want that. Anyways, you go over here, and uh, so we're going to have a blobby thing that's just a little bit smaller. It's not a lot smaller, just a little bit smaller. And then you duplicate that up a few times, and bear with me while we duplicate that up a few times. And once you do this trick once or twice, it's just uh, it's very, very easy to remember essentially forever because it's, it's so simple. So there we go. We have some blobs. Now I'm going to just put some lines on the paper. So I'm going to take a line from this point to that point, boom, boom, and there you go. That is how you simulate a vanishing point that is way off of your desk without jumping up and running across the room and like putting strings around like a crazy person. See, so I can get these lines that are converging just a tiny bit, and then I could even take that and I could flip it if I wanted to because I'm in Photoshop, so it's a lot easier to just flip stuff. Yeah, I guess in Photoshop you can actually play around with it a lot more. But yeah, so that way you can get really far out vanishing points and you can simulate a zoom lens. Now let's say you want to do the opposite and you want to do a wide angle lens. Well for that you could have uh, this mess which looks kind of like a big ball or something. And a wide angle lens is fun because if you think about it, whenever you're looking, let's say you're looking at some train tracks. You look to the left, oh you see some train tracks going to a vanishing point. Do, 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 do. Very simple. Then you look to your right. Oh, there's the same set of train tracks that you're on going to a vanishing point on the right. No problem. But if you were to use a wide angle lens and take a photograph of both of those, suddenly the lines can't be straight anymore because otherwise they're going to hit a weird angle together. And they don't hit a weird angle together. You're standing on the train tracks and you can see that they are actually one straight line. So the thing that a wide-angle lens does is it actually adds curvature. Like these lines essentially curve into each other as though they are one line. Because, I mean, in reality, they are one line. And the way it works is, essentially, it's almost like you're mapping the lines onto the surface of a sphere. And one vanishing point is going to be this part of the sphere, and the other vanishing point is going to be this part of the sphere. And it even works if you want to do three-point perspective with like the, the verticals going up to the top or down to the bottom. So that's how you do a wide-angle lens is, in, I mean, basically, instead of just having all the lines go straight to a vanishing point, you have them go, can I take that up? Instead, you have them go curved around like they're on top of a sphere. And right now, it just looks like a sphere sitting there. But if you actually warp your perspective lines like that when you're drawing it, I mean, you can get in there, and it can make some really cool effects. Like, let me just draw a little dude on top of this so you can see a cool effect. Like, let's say I want to have a guy being like, no, stop, but I want him to be in this cool fisheye lens perspective. Um, I'll maybe zoom out a little bit. There we go. You might be like, no, stop. Put the opacity up a little bit more there. So here we've got our guy, and normally we just have his arm go straight to his shoulder. Yeah, that's no fun. But we're in uh, a nice bubbly perspective, a nice wide angle lens. So his arm actually curves with the lines. And in fact, when he's over here, the vertical lines are starting to curve up too. And he's like, rah. You can tell that these, these are high class drawings. But the, uh, the point is, look at the perspective. And then his torso is here. And one note that you should know about perspective, it's pretty basic, is the horizon line is the one point in this one that would be straight and that connects the left and right vanishing points. And another thing they call the horizon line is the eye level line because that's where the viewer's height is in the picture. Like we are looking right here. That's where we are. There, And therefore anything we look at that's above that horizon line it's actually above us. We're looking up at it. And anything that's below us in that horizon line it's actually below us and we're looking down at it. And in fact a fisheye lens like this can kind of help accentuate that idea just a little bit more. See, since I'm looking down at him, 
you can just put his feet in the perspective like that and it puts him more even even simple little drawings like this you can see the adding perspective kind of just pumps it up because now he's grounded on a plane that we're looking at and it's got a nice wide angle lens perspective which is pretty cool and then this arm is going to be going back here but it's diminishing as it goes back in distance because it's got a wide angle lens in fact you could even push it a little more we could have this leg come down a little further like that just to accentuate the effect and then you zoom out and you see we got this weird distorted figure but that's kind of what it would look like if you're photographing him with a wide angle lens so in the final drawing you don't necessarily want to have all of these construction lines because then it looks like you're in some kind of a you know a, a hellish grid but if you do those construction lines really light like with the blue line pencil or I guess in Photoshop so you can turn it off <laughs> then you're left with a cool wide angle lens and especially if you have like some buildings back there or something that really helps like you know a, a thing flying up here stuff that helps like show the perspective on an object so it's not just constrained to the figure then it helps nail home the perspective and there you go that way you can use uh, zoom lenses and wide angle lenses on your comic book pages or even just like illustrations of any kind and it just it just kind of pumps it up and gives you more choices as a I guess as a cinematographer so to speak Uh, Liz is asking, how often do I do the grids? Is it at the point where I've internalized this sort of thing? And the answer is, it depends on the, on the panel. Most of the time, if it involves a lot of background elements, I've got to do the grid. I've got to like draw those lines there. I've got to get that framework so it can help me visualize where items are supposed to be and how fast they're, they're supposed to recede in the distance. So most of the time, if it involves backgrounds of any form, i got to have that framework in place. However, if it's a closer up panel, like let's say there's not a lot of background items, there's no buildings, it's just somebody like close up in the panel, I might be able to just wing it because I've drawn them in perspective with the, uh, with the safety lines enough times that I've kind of, kind of got the hang of it a little bit. So if it's just a character, if there's not a ton of other background stuff involved, sometimes I can just go ahead and draw them out and get away with, without using any of the perspective lines. But I would say, especially if you've never tried any of, the, any of these techniques before, um, try doing some figures with perspective lines because it really makes a big difference. It, it, it really helps bring them to life. It adds a lot more flair because most people just always draw the same thing. You know, they just draw like the guy and he's like, I'm from the side angle. I'm still from a side angle. It's an action pose from a side angle. But if you can take those different poses and those expressions and you can put them in a fisheye lens or like move the camera up here or do any kind of cool stuff like that, uh, it's, it's just a way to kind of stand out and have a little more fun with it. So yeah, I'll probably save some JPEGs of this, although I'm not sure how useful they're going to be apart from the audio. And hopefully some of you guys got a kick out of it and we can do more stuff like this on future weekly chats because... Yeah, because I, I want to I wanna do more stuff like this, have it be a little more interactive. People can maybe ask me questions as we're going, and hopefully people find that useful. So, yeah, uh, Geo, Potato, any, any words you want to throw out there before we call it a night? Well, uh, I guess just for future chats, um, did you want us to poll the, the community over what, like, tutorial or other thing they might find interesting, or do you already have some okay, stuff okay. planned? I don't really have a lot of stuff planned right now. I was just kind of like, I had the idea for like, hey, what if I, what if this new year I tried to do this with a stream and I could maybe draw stuff? So, yeah, I also think one of the one of the Patreon levels, if we get to a, a big level, is letting the backers vote on things. So I'm maybe I should incentivize the Patreon a little more or recognize the backers a little more and uh, get them involved in the voting because that would be sort of like, hey, you've been giving us money, so maybe you should call the shots a little bit so I, I might I might tie it into the crowdfunding and speaking of which I know uh, there's a lot of news about patreon right now and we're following it pretty closely and I kind of think patreon patreon made some bad bad calls but what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna stay with patreon because they're the mainstream platform you know assuming they don't just kick us off and uh, as alternatives rise because it looks like we're definitely gonna have some alternatives trying to be trying to trying to make it at this point. As alternatives rise, we're going to get on some of those. We'll see which ones seem the most stable, which ones actually survive the, uh, the strikes by the payment processors. And then when we have some solid options for you guys, we'll just post a journal and be like, hey, 
Pick the one that you like the best. We're going to try to post the same stuff everywhere at the same levels. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess uh, I guess that's it for tonight. Thanks, guys, for watching the stream. I hope you had fun. I hope some of this was kind of helpful. And, um, yeah, especially if you're a Patreon backer and you're at the level where you get to vote on stuff and suggest ideas, maybe start thinking about what would you like us to explore in a future stream, and we will see you there. For, for now, everybody have a great night, have a fantastic Christmas, and we will talk to you later.